Hi everyone. Fluffy is with me tonight while Chocolate is playing with a new toy downstairs. Since Chocolate got his long hair cut off, he runs, jumps, and plays like a kitten. And later this week, Fluffy is going to get his long white hair cut short like Chocolate's for spring and summer. And next week, I'll show you both of them looking like little lions. I love you, baby. Last Wednesday, on my February 27th Earth Files YouTube channel broadcast, I had just gotten back from the Conscious Life Expo in Los Angeles, and it was only two hours before this broadcast started last week. And I was able to reach Spartan One, the U.S. Navy SEAL, in my whistleblower videos to confirm his rank in Antarctica and his retirement rank. Spartan One is an extraordinary, strong, and decent human being who enlisted in the United States Navy in September 1985 and went through the Navy SEAL underwater demolitions training known as UDT and became a Navy SEAL in 1986. After he survived grueling Hell Week, in which he did not sleep for nearly six days while having to do major swimming and other physical challenges. He told me that more than intelligence, quote, you have to have the mental capability to finish it through no matter what you have to do to keep going, close quote. Then nearly 20 years later, after the most dangerous military missions anyone could endure, Spartan One was sent to Antarctica in August of 2003 as a lieutenant commander to go down into the huge black octagon structures in the ice, descending nearly two miles to extract an archaeologist who worked for the CIA, NSA, DIA, and who was studying strange hieroglyphs and symbols carved in all the black basalt walls and doors that I have been reporting about in January and February. After Antarctica, he was sent on new missions to the Middle East and Afghanistan, where he was shot with a bullet that hit his skull but did not penetrate his brain. He spent the next eight to nine months trying to learn to walk again and to feed himself, even though doctors said he would never walk again. By the end of 2004, he had willed himself back to functioning independently in spite of the terrible brain damage he had suffered. In December 2004, at a private ceremony in the Pentagon, Spartan One was honored with the silver oak leaf on his collar of a United States Navy SEAL commander. For the past two years, I have tried to protect him and Marine Spartan II, his buddy from childhood, hoping eventually I would be able to videotape them, backlighted and voice altered. That finally occurred in July 2018, eight months ago, and I have been working to unfold my exclusive copyrighted segments on this, my Earth Files YouTube channel, beginning with part one on January 23rd this year, and then updated parts one and two, first broadcast on February 20th, right before I left on Friday, February 22nd, to speak at the 2019 Conscious Life Expo at the LAX Hilton in Los Angeles. Understandably, after all the difficult, dangerous challenges that I have faced with these wonderful, brave guys, I have not granted anyone permission to use any of my copyrighted illustrations by Spartan One or any of the approximately 23 minutes that I have shared with you all on my Earth Files YouTube channel. If you had been in my shoes the past two years, you would do the same. This is not only very difficult to get military and intelligence whistleblowers. We just had a problem with the uh, teleprompter. If you had been in my shoes the past two years, you would do the same. This is not only very difficult to get military and intelligence whistleblowers on video, 
even if they have to be backlighted and voice altered to protect their identities. The reason for the protection is because we are still living in a country and a world in which the truth that we are not alone in this universe is still the most top secret subject in the U.S. government and its World War II allies and its adversaries of Russia and China. Meanwhile, the modern truth is there is even a current interstellar trade office on the eighth floor of the National Security Office in Washington, D.C., known to Spartan One. Interstellar trade contradicts the policies of lies and denials about our government's deep and complex knowledge of at least half a dozen other intelligences that have interacted with our planet and this solar system for at least 270 million years or longer, according to people who have worked in these highly, highly classified agencies and projects in Washington. We are living on a concocted planet in which handfuls of power brokers have managed to keep homo sapien sapien dumb and blind about the truth that extraterrestrial biological entities manipulated genes in already evolving primates to create standing up humanoids and the non-humans kept tweaking the genes of each new primate model up to this current one that is modern humanity. And Spartan 1 and 2 and other whistleblowers that I have talked to who are not yet on my recorded video, they all feel frustration and anger even that they go on mission after mission related to non-human interferences with Earth, the Moon, Mars, and beyond. But if they tell the truth, they will be punished. But like me, these honest warriors come to the same conclusion that I have come to over the last 40 years of trying to get to the bottom of worldwide bloodless animal mutilations, of human abductions by beam technologies that ETs use to transport to their UFO craft humans from houses, cars, farms, and other places. Then there are military like Spartan One who have encountered alien entities in the Middle East and South America and Antarctica and all over the planet. After their encounters, they feel angry that such a profound fact as other advanced intelligences are cohabiting with humans on planet Earth while harvesting human and animal genes, even now as we move toward the middle of the 21st century. They like me, are angry that these truths are kept from us by power brokers who run this planet for themselves and not for Homo sapiens sapien. And so I was shocked and enraged last Thursday, February 28th, to learn from Lori Moriarty that David Wilcock, behind my back, without ever asking me permission to use any of my difficult copyrighted work, and while he knew I was in Los Angeles at the Conscious Life Expo, he ripped off my part one and two and even took my copyrighted illustrations by Spartan One and put it all on a two-hour YouTube broadcast that he did on Saturday, March 2nd, 2019, beginning with his opening wind-up pitch about having explosive, mind-blowing information about two new whistleblowers in the context of his so-called cosmic disclosure that I have never had anything to do with. And I am suspect of the people that he has highlighted the past two or three years. In the first half hour, he only asked for money. And then in the second half, he didn't talk about Antarctica, but kept teasing his explosive new whistleblowers. And it was not until the beginning of the third half hour that he finally referenced my name without any link or reference to my Earth Files YouTube channel, in which I have a copyright watermark on every frame of my videos that says, quote, copyright 2019 by Linda Moulton Howe, earthfiles.com, close quote. And then he proceeded to sort of act out the content that I had exclusively reported in parts one and two, only three days before, and without any permission, 
he ripped off my copyrighted illustrations from Spartan One. So tonight, on this March 6, 2019 Earth Files YouTube channel, I want to announce that I filed a willful copyright infringement complaint with YouTube. And on Monday, March 4th, YouTube agreed with my copyright infringement filing against David Wilcock. His brazen, monetized broadcast without even a link or mention of my originating Earth Files YouTube channel or not even one word or permission request to me personally about using my exclusive copyrighted content and illustrations that was taken down by YouTube who agreed it was willful copyright infringement. Hopefully from now on everyone will continue to go forward positively without parasites. Please everyone know that my work has absolutely nothing to do with and never has had with David Wilcock, Emery Smith, Corey Good, or their associates. This Earth Files YouTube channel on Wednesday night is the only legitimate source of my Antarctica and space whistleblower videos, which I hope to keep unfolding at least one a month until June. Now, I would like to report news from the National Security Agency's Bluffdale, Utah, huge spy operation that works like a big black hole that has been sucking in American phone and text metadata since 9-11. The headline this week about a new policy change made me say out loud when I first saw it, thank God. And then within seconds, I thought if the NSA is making this change public now. What else are they doing behind the scenes to secretly track every American as our country has morphed from a democracy to an oligarchy teetering on the cliff of fascism? An oligarchy is a government where power is wielded by a small number of people who are rich and well-connected with the banks, the military, and the powerful politicians. While citizens have no influence, only they must pay taxes for the oligarchs to spend, or they will face incarceration if they do not pay taxes. So please go to my Earth Files news website at www.earthfiles.com and see my article posted uh, on March 5th, headlined 2001 to 2019, NSA shuts down sifting through bulk records of American phone calls. The bulk spying of American phone calls and texts started weeks after the 9-11 attacks in New York, Washington, and Pennsylvania. Then President George Bush ordered the National Security Agency to search for Al-Qaeda terrorist plotters in American phone call records. And then in 2013, the UK Guardian reported from the huge download of classified files leaked by former NSA employee Edward Snowden that the NSA was doing massive USA phone and text metadata spying. That's what provoked Congress to end the Bush NSA American phone spying program and then replaced it with what is called the USA Freedom Act of 2015. And that is scheduled to expire this year in December. So on March 2nd, 2019, Lawfare podcast with Luke Murray. He's the House Minority Leader's National Security Advisor. Mr. Murray revealed that the Trump administration, quote, has not actually been using this Freedom Act for the past six months. I'm actually not certain that this administration will want to start that back up, close quote. Further, in the Lawfare podcast, Mr. Murray described, quote, NSA technical irregularities, close quote, as having caused NSA to gather hundreds of millions of call and text records from American phone message logs that were never legal to collect. So according 
to the March 5, 2019 reporting by the New York Times about this change. Quote, the NSA has had to purge hundreds of millions of call and text records gathered from American telecommunications firms, close quote. Well, during the intense debates after the Edward Snowden NSA documents leak in 2013, the truth emerged that the bulk phone metadata spying has never stopped a single terrorist attack. So the question before Congress, the administration, and the American people now in 2019 is, why restart the massive American phone spying program that is the opposite of how our original democratic republic began? And such wholesale spying should never repeat now or in the future. Okay, now, so that is from the serious tonight. And I would like uh, Lori to go to comments and your questions. Uh, and uh, I hope that a lot of you who come to my Earth Files YouTube channel uh, feel the same way as I do about the fact that on the one hand, the NSA is closing down the bulk metadata on phone calls and text. But the feeling is that waiting in the wings are already in operation is something else ongoing. Listening to calls, listening to iPhones, listening through windows, listening everywhere from satellites and technology and drones that very few Americans have ever suspected would be turned on all of us. And I, I guess I feel really seriously about this, and that is why I'm highlighting it uh, tonight in my Earth Files report. But I also feel also very strongly and seriously that once upon a time, it felt like growing up and living in this country, that a lot of people at least tried to play by rules. And copyrights are part of those rules. And it feels as if everything is beginning to disintegrate into doing anything, even if it's a total lie, and put it up in the YouTube or someplace else just for money. I'll never do that here. Laurie, do we have any questions and comments? Well, the first thing I would like to say is that right now, the, the thousand or so people that are contributing to the chat are supporting you wholeheartedly. Oh, so they're 100% behind your decision and it feels like the, the majority are are proud of what you did and supporting your decision. Thank so you. that's first. Thank you very much. And we should thank our very generous Super Chats this evening. Thank you. And they, there has been so much conversation going on that thus far we only have one question All right. for you. Let's and go. The on. chat's going so quick we can barely read it. So if anyone has questions, now is the time to put them down. What are your thoughts about blue-eyed redheads, the rarest of all human beings, and historically ribbed for not having souls? You talked about blue-eyed redhead ETs and some ETs without souls. Is there a connection? It is a question that I wish I could answer and you would think after 40 years from 1979, those first steps on animal mutilations to 2019, uh, that I would have an answer. But the truth is that when you talk with Spartan 1 and Spartan 2, and another Navy SEAL whistleblower that's not on video, but he knows a lot. And uh, remember, even Spartan 1 said in, my, uh, uh, piece, in pieces in parts 1 and 2, that what he wanted to know is who, who is it that we are dealing with negatively? And if we are trying to save our planet, and there are uh, some ETs that want to save our planet and some don't, let's... Let's have it all out so we know honestly 
who are we dealing with and why and what are their agendas and how can uh, some of them help us. And the fact is that just about anyone who has had a specific mission, they know that there are non-humans, no, no question. Uh, they know that there have been alien bases and probably are still on the moon uh, and by firsthand information and on Mars and throughout the solar system and throughout the Milky Way galaxy. These are firsthand pieces of information. And everybody seems to have that same question. Who exactly are we dealing with, with which agendas, what do they look like? And here is my guess about why it is so difficult to make an answer. Remember how I have talked about my third book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness. And I've talked about that very large hundred and some page chapter that I have in which there are half a dozen people in the human abduction syndrome who draw sketches of a cloning technology that the non-humans are using to make any type of body container, and that's what they refer to it in the telepathic download in the abduction heads. The abductees hear the word container, meaning in the United States, in our English, the word container, that they are making body containers. Now, when you get to body containers, I have what I would consider to be a kind of bell-shaped curve of explanations, some rare on either end and some common in the middle, a bell-shaped curve, that range from people who have worked in the CIA, the DIA, the NSA, military intel, those that have had any insight, and then the remote viewers, the remote viewers who have worked for the intelligence agencies. And they have had tasking, and they have come back from uh, their doing remote viewing and eventually uh, they find out what it was that they were remote viewing. And in many uh, of these cases, it has been something about consciousness, other consciousness in the universe. And they all, they all come back with the universe is teeming with life. But to get a handle on which part of this galaxy, which part of our solar system, which part of the universe goes with any specific type, the way we all think of various nationalities on Earth, and that certain clothes or garments or hats delineate people who are in military or uh, who may be dancers and so forth. It appears to be much more difficult now, backing up this difficulty on trying to find out if you're red-haired and you have crystal blue eyes, are you automatically RH negative or are you automatically in a hybrid? It's a hybrid category that we would be talking about. I don't know of any such one-to-one-to-one-to-one uh, factor that would be considered a fact. What I do know is that that Defense Intelligence Agency analyst who met with me in December 1999, I've gone into that in some depth here on my YouTube channel, not the whole story, but several pieces. And he is the one, I guess tonight is as good as any. This is this is really difficult material. So now what I'm going to unfold, keep in mind that this man worked for 23 years for the Defense Intelligence Agency, and the way he described his work to me was that he monitored and analyzed the geopolitical territorial conflict of three extraterrestrial biological civilizations on our planet throughout this solar system and the Milky Way galaxy, meaning 
It isn't just earth. And I won't go into the whole huge story tonight. I'll just cut down to a bottom line. He said that the Middle East or Mesopotamia or pre-Mesopotamia has been a war zone for millions and millions of years. And he said that going back at least 270 million years ago, there were two dominant competitors on this planet. Tall blondes and maybe tall whites, maybe tall eight feet, maybe a little taller, maybe even as tall as 10, some pure white, and then there are the blonde-haired, blue-eyed Viking type. Nobody has ever once explained to me what the relationship is, if any, between those two. Beyond the fact that they would both have the characterization of being very tall. They, according to the DIA analyst, were in conflict, not open, shoot, bomb warfare. This is the way he put it to me. He said, those advanced non-humans, they don't war the way we think of war. They're not even necessarily trying to kill each other. He said, they're, they're, they have two dominant ways in which they war. One is by using time. They will move perhaps a perceived enemy into another timeline. Or they will make a hologram and they will use three-dimensional holograms in ways that would be baffling to us, that will change terrains or create all kinds of things that are not there, and that the mental games that are played between the tall ones, we'll call, well, let's just call them the talls, and the Ebens, the extraterrestrial biological entities, are on these kinds of levels, um, manipulating things into time, using holograms, and the third was being able to neutralize gravity at a point source, a small area, or a huge area, and that once you can battle, quote unquote, or have conflict in those three modes, then it's a whole other type of existence. It's a whole other type of conflict. And then you say, well, what is it that they want? If they can do all that, and if they are almost equally matched, what is it that they want? And if I boil down the seven hours of discussion back in December 1999, it would come to Earth is a very good laboratory. And Earth has been being used for millions of years by a variety of types, some short, some longer term. He said the Ebens had the 80 million year long experiment with the dinosaurs. He referred to it as we know it was their experiment and that they ended it, he thought, and they were not sure if they produced the six mile asteroid to do the impact to take out their 80 million year long dinosaur experiment, or if it just happened to be that this was a accident in the solar system that it was coming toward Earth and they didn't do anything to stop it. He said, we knew, we knew well that the Talls and the Ebens can move anything they want. These are words that still today echo in my mind. 
They could move anything they want into another timeline. I remember even the phrase, we have wars of death and bullets and starvation and prisoners and all of the horrors. They just move whatever they have managed to encapsulate or whatever the word would be, they just move them into another timeline. Then I suppose the challenge would be if they both have timeline moving technology, how would you keep something you perceived as your, I don't even know if enemy is the right word, your challenger for territory, your challenger over the Earth laboratory? How would you keep it in another timeline that you had moved it to? Because you would presume that both sides would always have the ability to pluck themselves back out of timelines and would eventually understand and defeat the holograms and be able to play with neutralizing gravity in a number of ways. So it's hard to imagine what that kind of war was. But he said, finally, what they had come to understand was that the Ebens and these tall humanoids, some with hair, gold, uh, some without hair, which is what the one Spartan one saw the photos of. Um, and I've been told that the red-haired, crystal blue-eyed were, we'll call it part of a hybridization program here. Um, but if you come down to them being able to have conflict over a laboratory and that the purpose of the laboratory is genetic manipulation to create a whole bunch of containers, automatically this discussion and these questions go where I have been trying to understand ever since I did Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness. What exactly is the application of all of these cloned bodies in this cloning technology that the DIA guy knew all about, but didn't understand himself entirely. And that in Glimpses Volume 2, that book of mine came out in 1998 in the very first edition. It's been reprinted and is always available at myearthfiles.com. When you look at the drawings that have been done and you hear the abductees, and they are saying that they're they hear in their mind that the key to what these non-humans are doing has to do with the entity and that the entity that comes across into the human mind telepathically is they're talking about the soul. And now we have come back full circle to part of what I was talking about last week and in previous uh, weeks. I think the soul is the most important part of us. If there was a concentration on creating cloned bodies, whether in war, experimentation, territorial conflict, whatever the reason, would the cloned bodies that the non-humans would be harvesting genetic material from animals and humans on this planet as part of this cloning container bodies, would it be for life as we know life, with consciousness and a soul? Or is that the part that they cannot do? Is that the part that they want? And is that why, in the case of Linda Porter in My Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness, from childhood on, she had shadow people in her bedroom. She had a little craft, with balls of light, a little gray that was clearly an android. She understood it was an android. She knew that it was like something there, the way we would have a vacuum cleaner. And when her, her whole huge abduction scenario uh, with these beings as it played out and she was talking to me, 
uh, for hours and hours. She says at one point that there was something very important about the entity, which she understood to be our soul, that the entity had to remain in certain containers for a very specific period of time or something would be off with whatever the entity, the ETs or non-humans were uh, investigating. And that in her case, she thought to her, they were being not kind. She said those words, not kind, but not maybe a little benevolence because they explained to her, we know that you had rheumatic fever when you were young and the rheumatic fever has hurt your heart and you are going to die soon if we do not change. We will let your body die. We have this other one, it was uh, these clone tubes and we will reactivate the entity from your, your body that's going to die and put it in the new young one that has a good heart. So she, she felt that they weren't trying to really hurt her in the long run, but as she was telling me this, I remember she extended her arms to me and she had tears in her eyes. And as she extended her arms to me sitting just a couple of feet away, she said, Linda, whose hands and arms are these? I saw one of my body die. I was watching who was watching and who am I now in the body here? And she started sobbing. Well, that kind of confusion and complexity, I would say, sums up a lot of the challenges of trying to understand anything about the human abduction syndrome in terms of these different types, the different hair colorings or no hair, the different eyes, the different skins, the different everything. Are they, some of them working together on a genetic program in a laboratory called Earth? Maybe. Certainly some are. But do they work together? That's the question. And for those that are not, for those non-humans who have their own agendas, and some may not be nice, would that be the only reason that the government decided over the last 70 years that we were never to know that we're not alone in this universe? It's teeming with life and a lot of it has been coming and using and harvesting from our planet for millions of years, that might be the reason for government policy of lies and denials. But at, eight, at this year of 2019, as we are headed out to do a, a permanent base, is what is being said on the moon, that Elon Musk or others are going to do a base on Mars, maybe launch in two years. Humanity is already moving into space. Before humanity on Earth has even been told the truth that we're not alone in this universe, that there are friendlies, unfriendlies, and neutrals, that throughout our history, a lot of the entities that humans kept dumb and blind got down on their knees to, as gods, we're never gods. Everything in me, in my work, in my books, in my documentaries, in the radio, in television, in this YouTube channel, conferences, it seems, and I'm going to use the word now because it's true, it feels urgent to me. There is an urgency in the timeline that every human, homo sapien sapien human on earth be told the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. 
And if some people are shocked, that is better than having something appear in the sky suddenly one day and then you are really traumatized. I don't think, at this point, I do not think we have anything to be really scared about in terms of the non-humans because I think that the remote viewers and others in the military have said, we have allies. And those allies are protecting us and have for a long time. And that what we need to do is to have that cold shower on the whole planet. Wake up. We're not alone. Our history needs to be completely reconstructed. And then, it couldn't be any worse than what we have been experiencing on our planet as humans in Syria and Venezuela and global warming without help from some advanced technology. Global warming could be the unrestrained hell in another 20 to 30 years that no one will be able to escape. Right now, if we had those headlines, if this broke open, if we were told, and then the government might have technology waiting in the wings that they haven't been bringing out because they didn't want to say, well, here, we do have something, I do this, 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 and we back engineered it from technology we got from someplace else. Go ahead and do it. May all the nations do it that have it. So, if you feel yourself, if you feel any urgency about this moment in time, let me know. And I have been getting letters from some, some people who feel like I do, that there is some urgency, but I don't mean to leave just that word, urgent. Your dialogue and my dialogue and dialogues about this, that alone could help shift this in maybe Maybe there is something that is just waiting and the timeline like, like tumblers rolling. The tumblers are rolling and that if we became conscious as a planet to real truth and stop being oligarchs and fascism and totalitarianism and we move toward a planet that was honest everywhere with each other we might survive really well because there could be that there are forces out there in the unseen and the seen who are waiting for Homo sapien sapien as a collective whole to stand up together with the governments and say, we get it. We're not alone in this universe. We're not going to lie down on the ground. We're going to stand up with whatever this is, only we're going to stand up together. No more lies, no more manipulations of genes without permission. We're drawing a line. Earth is inhabited by Homo sapiens sapien. And we want to join the community of positive soul universe. Well, that's at least my dream. Laurie, do we have another comment or question? Yes, we sure do. I think you're like this one. Linda, what would Art Bell be thinking about what's going on in this world today? <laughs> he would say the same thing I did in the open about the United States in 2014 in that scientific analysis was uh, it published in the uh, American Political Science Review that we see as being a democracy a long time ago and that we are in textbook definition in 2014, an oligarchy where only the rich, only the wired with the political power makers have any influence. Have you ever wondered how the vast majority of Americans who think that their votes count, who think that the majority should always prevail, have not ever prevailed on gun 
uh, uh, legislation, uh, like on those uh, multiple, what, what are the, what are they called, the ones where they, in Las Vegas, the guy had the, what is that called? It's a, it's a military. Um, mass shootings? Yeah, the mass shootings, but what is the name of that thing when they put, may, they concoct a, a rifle so it'll turn into an, uh, shooting bullets all the time? You're talking about the bump a stock, bump stock, stock fully automatic? Yeah. That kind of stuff that nobody needs. That why have we not been able to get that completely out of this country? Why, when it comes to uh, the nicotine based pesticides that are clearly destroying the pollinators we need for food, there's no question about it anymore. And France and other countries in Europe are banning. Why can we not get it banned in the United States? It doesn't have anything to do, it seems, anymore with the majority of people putting down in a poll. I w would like to see uh, uh, the, uh, this bump stock. I'd like to see it gone from the United States. Th they've done polls, and that has been the uh, majority uh, feeling. And the, these are the moments when you begin to realize that the individual in the United States is only one thing to the power brokers, a taxpayer. That's it. And that as we are going forward, if my dear friend Jim Mars, God rest him, whatever dimension he is in, and I know he's in another dimension, spinning around with his hat on, that he would say, exactly as I wrote in the beginning, we're at an oligarchy by political scientists. We're no longer a democracy. And here is the cliff of fascism. And fascism, by political science definition, is when the corporations and the government are joined at the hip. They are the only ones who determine what happens. That's where we are in the United States now, we are right on that brink. Is that the direction that we want to go? Well, these are evolutionary changes that have been taking place because so much of our education as an American citizenry that once upon a time was a, a democratic republic a democracy only that can function and survive if every single person in that democracy has similar information. Once, as happened in the 1940s going forward, once the government separated out a black program to retrieve and study UFOs and ETs and did so underground and more and more money and policy decisions were going to investigate that, back engineer. The future was writ, it was writ large and we're no longer a democracy. Can we ever put the genie back in the bottle? Can we take an oligarchy on the cliff of fascism and put it back and make this country be a democracy again? That's probably, right now, this is the intersection. All the agitation, all the intense emotional energy that is everywhere, because everything is in this moment where you get the most energy when something's going to go psh, And on the other side of so much of this is all of the money and the brain power that has gone to back engineering technology from someplace else, applying it in ways that we as a citizenry, citizenry don't know, and that the money, barter systems are used for, to make things happen. Barter is the definition of how you make power. Power is the ability to do something. So back in the 40s, with the retrievals of the first crash disks, we just went 
like, a, like the country was split like that. But the tax-paying citizens didn't know. And now the pigeons are really coming home to roost. And I, I hope that those of you who do have any firsthand information in a science capacity, in a doctor capacity, in military capacity, intelligence, retired or otherwise, if you have more information to give me about first-hand knowledge, not second-hand, first-hand knowledge of the different types of non-humans we're supposed to be dealing with at least seven, where are they from exactly, who cohabits on planet Earth, what is going on throughout our solar system. There's, uh, this is the kind of information if I could get credible information, I would like to report. Because the feeling is, this is one way to help all of you be educated about this complex story that uh, the government just keeps wanting to keep shut down. And I know that all of you coming, that you want the same type of information and truth that I do. And Lori, did, how close are we to 100,000 <laughs> subscribers? Well, that is a great question, and it just so happens, I know, that we are exactly 1,270 people away. Very, very close. Yay! And I'll tell you, right now, there's over 2,000 people watching, so if everybody isn't a subscriber, they need to hit that button. Yeah, you guys, help me get to 100,000 and keep going, because the more people that we have at this YouTube channel, the more and larger is our dialogue. And th there is something I feel in my gut that if we could just keep this going, I had a wonderful email uh, from a male uh, emailer this week. And he said, Linda, after last week, I didn't want your YouTube channel to end. I wanted to keep talking. You're the only people that I have ever been able to even venture uh, any of my questions or comments. And he sent me a fascinating email. And I thought, you know, I understand what he means. And that's what I have meant over this past several months when we started the YouTube channel. If we could start having the kind of dialogue where you're not afraid, you don't have to use your real names, but you're not afraid to ask a question, send me an email, and we will, and I am going to uh, be doing uh, where I will be taking more and more emails like I did last week and I will start weaving them in the subject matter right from the emails that are absolutely fascinating. I have files and files full. We as a group at Earth Files YouTube channel, getting other people in the whole world to, to start coming and, and re realizing, yes, they can, they can say when I was five years old, I went to the ceiling or a little gray thing came in my bedroom or I heard a buzzing in the closet and out came a yellow glowing orb, or I was out uh, doing uh, harvesting of wheat with my dad and a beam came down from something in the sky and we saw it pick up a cow. How fantastic if we could have honest discussions about these subjects that the government has wanted completely off limits for at least 70 years that we could have honest discussions and, and that we say when it's speculation, we say when it's a dream, we say whatever it is, not afraid. And when it is something we've seen with our conscious mind and our eyes, or we know somebody is that we can bring into the discussion who consciously has been in Antarctica or South America or someplace where they have had a mission with ETs that there's a difference. There's a difference between firsthand proven experience and then there's anecdotal. All of this, if we are telling each other the truth and we are not afraid to say, this is what I remember, we could have something really more powerful than I could ever have imagined. 
and it would be thrilling at this time where there are expectations that by 2026, by 2026, the planet Earth could be like a bucking horse to every part of the planet just because of violent weather pendulum changes. So, Laurie, uh, let's see. What about one more? Okay. Do you know about what Whitley Strieber is currently writing? Can you tell us? No, I don't know. I haven't talked with Whitley since, I think, a conference uh, in 2018 about anything he's writing. Uh, his last book, I can say that, uh, was fascinating about his uh, doing a meditation, I believe at three o'clock in the morning, and communicating with Anne, his wife, God rest her, uh, who, when she passed, uh, I think that they had uh, a bond about trying to communicate. And he wrote an entire book about his communications with Anne in another dimension. That part I know. D does, the, does the questioner know about another book that he is writing? Maybe they were looking for you to tell them a secret. So here's another great question that I think a lot of people <clears throat> would want to know. Are you going to put this work into a book at some point, meaning the Spartan interview is about Antarctica? I definitely want to. Uh, it, it, is, it isn't just those two voices. There are others around with facets that support them. And those other military people may never even consider the possibility of uh, being on video, even though I'm putting an entire Photoshop black, the, there's no, no way to see their face. But I could do interviews where it's text. So I could weave from Spartan 1 and Spartan 2 and Brian S and another Navy SEAL and a couple of other that I uh, know who are very concerned, they agree and support everything uh, that I have been reporting. But the fear, the fear of stepping outside of that, it's almost like a 1984 insane restriction on planet Earth. You can't tell anyone that we are not alone in the universe. My Lord, if we get <clears throat> to the next century, I would not be surprised that there would be books written in that century looking back at the bizarre, upside down, bass backwards policies of denying an entire planet the truth about our relationship with the universe, with ourselves, with non-humans, androids, clones, the entire planet as a laboratory, as if humans couldn't handle it. I don't think that's true at all. I think all of you coming, you're handling it just fine. I've been, I've been trying to get to the bottom of this since September of 1979, 40 years. And I have been shocked a couple of times, but it, it didn't knock me to the ground and it certainly didn't stop me. And so that's what I think the vast majority of people, I think that would be their reaction. And I would welcome all of your comments on what you think personally is the single most important subject that you feel is not being discussed or described anywhere and that I might open up on my Earth Files YouTube channel. And I have never ever violated anybody's request for anonymity, not in these 40 years once. So 
you know that you can trust if you say, I want my name withheld, but I would very much like you to read my letter. I give you permission to read my letter. That is a, a way to do it. For those of you who feel like now that you can step out to that next zone, Linda, you have my permission to use your name, to use you, you speaking about yourself, to use my name, to use where I'm from. I would never use addresses or phone numbers or anything like that. But the more we can finally get to a point where people are not afraid to use their own names and at least a city and a state where they live, then we all begin to understand that texture a little bit more and we become more and more real in this dialogue. And as a reporter, you'll always hope that you will be interacting and interviewing with people that you can put their, all of their information about their background and their life to go with who they are. And that's the reason in uh, interviews that you do formally, that you always ask for name, address, all of the educational background titles. But what I'm doing on the Earth Files YouTube channel it is a different category. I look at this more and more as a discussion with the world on topics that people feel like they have never been able to talk about before. And that is a great feeling. I look forward to next Wednesday. I thank you so much. And I'll show you fluffy and chocolate, both with haircuts. <laughs> And Linda, one person does one.